Kathleen Staten with Ars Lyrica, and this is Center Stage. I'm here with Jonathan Dove, composer. How are you today? Very well, thank you. It's lovely to talk to you. You didn't even know that this show was going ahead, did you? No, no, no. It's a lovely surprise. <laughs> COVID has thrown us all for a loop. Um, have many of your other works uh, been performed in this space of about 18 months? Uh, gosh, well, I've had performances, but I don't think I've had any opera performances. Although, curiously, arrangements that I made of famous operas uh, for a touring company years ago in the 1980s um, have been useful during COVID because they were arrangements for like 15 players. And so you could have a distanced orchestra. So I've seen my arrangement of the Valkyrie and um, the Rheingold arrangement, which is for 18 players. You can imagine how distanced those can be. That was used in Germany. And my arrangement of La Boheme was used by English National Opera for a drive-in production <laughs> of, of La Boheme. Um, so kind of like by proxy, I've had some opera performances. <laughs> oh, and, and Seattle Opera made a film. They couldn't do a live performance of Flight, uh, which is probably my best known opera. Um, but they did an extraordinary film of it in the Seattle Museum of Flight, which used to be an airport. So uh, this is an opera. It's a comic opera. Well, part of it's funny anyway, uh, set in an, in an airport. And uh, they actually, this is the first time it's been performed in an actual airport. Now, is Flight the one, which one of your operas was the one that was called The Modern Day Marriage of Figaro? Uh, it was probably that one. I, I did, in fact, say what I'd love to write is a Figaro for the 90s. That was my intention. Of course, it's impossible for all, I mean, A, I'm not Mozart, but, but <laughs> B, um, a lot has changed since 1790 and, and uh, marriages are different now. And, and also, if marriages go wrong, the consequences are different now. Uh, but it was from thinking about couples and couples who maybe shouldn't be together or got into the you know uh, into a bad place. Um, then when when those thoughts encountered a real life story, which was the refugee living in Charles de Gaulle Airport, um, out came a whole series of encounters, and uh, and that's how that opera started. Now, what a brilliant segue you've offered us here talking about couples and opera, which leads us, of course, to Orpheus and Eurydice. Yes, um, or at least that's how we used to think of them until uh, the Italian writer Italo Calvino uh, re rewrote the familiar myth uh, from a quite different angle. And did you realize that Eurydice, in fact, used to be the girlfriend of Pluto? Uh, I think something that perhaps only Calvino knew. Um, and... And so from his point of view, uh, it was a bad thing when Orpheus turned up and started playing what for Pluto was terrible music because it lured uh, Eurydice, Eurydice away from him. So it's not, not the story quite as you know it. I think we're very much looking forward to that. Our audiences, though, are not as familiar with contemporary music. And that's also something I wanted to talk with you about today. We're trained, of course, in the Baroque to recognize the circle of fifths from a mile off. But that isn't at all your style of composition. Tell us about this pan-diatonic style of writing that you have. <laughs> Gosh, well, um, I suppose it means that I like to use things that sound like keys, but I just don't use them in quite the same way um, as Mozart and, and you know, Verdi might have used them. Uh, but actually, to be honest, to most music lovers, my music sounds tonal. So it's probably easier just to think, oh, well, it is kind of tonal. Um, <laughs> and it's only a musicologist who would make some fine distinctions. Uh, so, uh, and as it happens, this opera, um, which I originally wrote in Italian, so it was called Lautre Eurydice, but uh, the other Eurydice. Um, it was originally part of an evening of Baroque laments, um, including work by Monteverdi. And, and for that reason, I've written it for Baroque instruments. Um, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting if my piece sounded even older than the pieces that are on the program. So I was actually thinking about a kind of an ancient music. That's what I was started to imagine. Um, so the very first thing you hear are they're all on the white notes of the piano, but there is no piano. It's it's, it's strings and harpsichord. Um, and then 
A minor triad, the very simple harmonies. Uh, and so I don't think it in fact sounds, I don't think you would think, oh, this is from the 17th century uh, after a while, but it was certainly intended to suggest another time, an earlier time. That's fascinating. Um, also, tell us about the instrumentation with the saxophone and the Baroque oboe. As an oboist, I find that quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, well, well, in a way, I was making use of um, partly what was available to me. Uh, when I first read this story, I thought, well, goodness, this is because it, the images in it are very spectacular. It starts off with Pluto and he's describing what it's like to live in the underworld and, and these you know, vast uh, spaces and... Um, and I thought, well, if you had an orchestra that the size of the one that Holst used in the planets, yes, we could do that. And uh, Adam Pollock, who uh, used to run this festival in Tuscany, for which I, I wrote the piece, said, well, um, you know, I think we maybe have got a harpsichord and a cello. And, a, and I think, oh, right, so it's quite a different scale. So I completely reimagined it. But I, then I realised, if you've got a really wonderful baritone singing the role of Pluto, because it's a, it's a solo opera, um, then actually the instruments can just accompany him. We don't need to create all of the spectacle in the orchestra. We can sort of suggest it, but actually the singer will take us into this world um, through the power of their imagination. Um, so I, to be honest, I can't now exactly remember. I think maybe the saxophone was a special request. Um, it was certainly wanted something that would sound very different from all of the other instruments. Uh, and so, in fact, when, um, when Orpheus, when we first hear Orpheus', Orpheus is music, there's a, a complete change of key um, and, and we hear the saxophone. So it's like a, a sort of a, an eruption from, an, yeah, from another world. Orpheus is on the surface of the earth and Pluto's below. So there needs to be something different. And in fact, uh, again, if you were using a piano, which I'm not, uh, the, the saxophone is playing on the on the black notes and the strings are on the white notes. Um, so both sides of this musical struggle sound quite euphonious on their own. They sound like pleasant harmony, but when the two go together, they, they really clash. So this is the, the clash between Orpheus and, and Pluto. In talking to Doug, I was fascinated to hear from him what it's like to prepare to sing a 30 minute solo opera. Was that something that you had in mind as you were composing about both the mental and physical taxation that it would present for the soloist? Do you know, I, I wrote fairly fearless, fearlessly because I was writing for an extraordinary performer, Omar Ibrahim, uh, who has a, a powerful voice, uh, but is also is a very unusual, a very charismatic and compelling performer. And I had seen him do incredibly difficult things. Um, in fact, in my early days, when I used to play the piano for rehearsals of opera productions, um, I can remember rehearsing with him, Bert Whistle's Punch and Judy. Um, if you can sing that, I thought, well, you, you can sing anything. And so nothing I write will be frightening to him. And also the, the orchestra is not, powerful in by comparison with the symphony orchestra in the pit of an opera house there are i can't remember perhaps about 12 instruments playing um and a lot of it is strings there's a harpsichord and a theorbo um so it's um it's he doesn't the singer doesn't have to fight to make himself heard I love that you're writing your operas for a younger audience. How did you find that voice or what compelled you to be, to be writing for that audience today? I think there were, I had a number of experiences in my kind of formative years before I was really, I, I, before I'd really got started as a composer, I was already doing kind of outreach work for opera companies. Um, and there was one particularly formative experience, which was working on a, production of West Side Story, but a very unusual one. It was a community production. So it was not in an opera house, it was in a, an old factory. And there were 200 people performing. Um, and the audience didn't get to sit down. The audience was promenading. So the audience uh, was kind of in, swept up into the story and felt by, by the end of it that they had been singing along with the, the cast. And I, I, my task again, I was orchestrating on that occasion, but it made me wonder, well, what would it be like if 
this community was telling its own story uh, that it wasn't, you know, they weren't pretending to be New Yorkers. And I then, from that, wrote a series of community operas for Glyndebourne. Mm. Um, but uh, sort of along similar lines that there would be two or 300 people on stage singing. And then whoever wanted to join in the orchestra would join in. There would be a handful of professional singers and a handful of professional instrumentalists. Um, I, th I think what I learned from all, all of those things well, was just how powerful the excitement and enthusiasm of, of amateurs is, that also that opera is a wonderful thing to do. I mean, it's obviously very nice to go to, but actually doing it is really the thing. Um, and so the more people that can do it, the more exciting it is for them. Um, I also felt being involved in this promenade production that opera, the operatic experience was just too important to be restricted only to the opera house. I mean, there are things, obviously, opera houses are beautifully designed for, for what happens there. So the acoustics are, of course, wonderful. And uh, there's all kinds of machinery. And you know, there's lots of ways that you can't beat a really good opera house. But there are many people who don't feel that it's the place for them. And yet, if only they would hear it, they would get so much out of opera. So it's been a big thing for me to try and take opera out of the opera house at least some of the time. And uh, then perhaps, a, you know, an audience who maybe is a little wary of the opera house will will come to somewhere different. Um, and in fact, the, so this, the Lautre Eurydice, the other Eurydice, was first performed in a festival that was not an opera house. It was in a, it's a, at the cloister of a medieval monastery high on a hill in Tuscany. And it's a very seductive place. Um, it, the opera is performed outdoors, but because of the cloister, the, there's a very good acoustic. But you're also aware the stars are part of the scenery and you get the smell of, you know, wild thyme and herbs on the, on the breeze. Uh, so it's a kind of different sensual experience. So I've, I'm used to writing operas for lots of different uh, situations. And in the end, it comes down to somebody telling a story by, by singing it. And um, you can be captivated. And I've seen uh, operas where there's no accompaniment at all. An a cappella opera, they just somebody gets their notes from a, a tuned wine glass and, and off they go. Of course, there are lots of things that are powerful about opera, but at the heart of it is is the human voice and uh, a singer who is also an actor. Uh, when when their imagination is seized by the the drama that they're in, there's there's no experience like it. We couldn't agree with you more about the importance of opera. And we are so grateful for the opportunity to pair your work alongside Bach uh, and that you wrote something for historical instruments. Jonathan, thank you so much for your time today and for your passion for this art form that I hope will continue for a very long time, especially with uh, composers like you writing for it. Mm -hmm.